everyone to the Lieutenant Governor's Computing Challenge Virtual Showcase. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and is being live streamed. Thank you for attending. I'm gonna turn it over to Norm Sondheimer. Thank you, Norm. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we're here to celebrate our students, showcase a representative sample of their ideas and announce their favorites. I'm gonna be your master of ceremonies. So to begin the event, I had the distinct honor of introducing Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz, whose idea it was to create the Computing Challenge. Without her efforts, we wouldn't have a chance to celebrate our students. Lieutenant Governor. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Norm, uh, for all of your wonderful help and support of this amazing COVID-19 computing challenge. It's such a pleasure to join all of you today to celebrate the very creative, innovative, and talented students that we have in our beautiful state of Connecticut. As Lieutenant Governor, I wear many hats, uh, but my favorite hat that I wear is chairing the Council on Women and Girls that was created by Governor Lamont upon our taking office. And uh, the council is made up of each of the cabinet secretaries or 27 state agency commissioners, um, representatives from our state legislature and all of our con constitutional officers, including our secretary of the state, our state treasurer, controller, and attorney general. And so the purpose of this council is to make sure that our state has a coordinated response um, with respect to issues that affect the lives of women and girls and their families in our state. So we have four subcommittees um, in pursuit of this goal. One is economic opportunity and workforce equity. Another is health and safety. Another is leadership and the Education and STEAM subcommittee is responsible for bringing us together with our coding challenge and creating this opportunity to share uh, the talent and creativity of our students. Um, the goal of our Education and STEAM subcommittee is to encourage educational advancement for women and girls in the area of science, technology, math, and engineering, and the arts. Um, and I am a huge advocate for equal representation of women in our workforce and pay equity. And unfortunately, in the STEM fields, women continue to be underrepresented. Um, so in addition to serving as the council chair, uh, I also serve as the honorary chair of the Million Women Mentors. I hear it, but you don't see no picture. Um, and the, um, the uh, mission of Million Women Mentors is to make sure that our young women and girls are encouraged to pursue careers in uh, STEM and that they have access to leadership opportunities through mentoring. Um, so you can be assured that um, we in the state of Connecticut are trying to address the lack of women um, and underrepresentation of women in the STEM fields here in our state. Um, we also know that we need to start addressing women working in STEM fields by first, encouraging our young girls to be more involved in STEM education activities. Um, and that's why, you know, this coding challenge is so important to our education and STEAM subcommittee and to our State Department of Education and our steering com committee members that have volunteered so much of their time to bring this coding challenge together um, this spring. So in the midst of this global pandemic, uh, we remain very committed to making sure that we advance quality education. And um, we also recognize how important our young people are 
in helping us to uh, face those challenges and to uh, make sure that we have some creative solutions. So I'm very proud of the students today. Uh, we received almost 400 submissions in response to our challenge and uh, your work is just uh, incredible. So thank you all for participating. And um, I'm glad that we now have the opportunity to highlight some of the entries. Um, we're looking forward to keeping this coding momentum going and when we start the new school year. So at this time, I'd like to pass the program back to our uh, MC, Mr. Sodheimer. Norm, thank you so much. Actually, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much. Uh, let me show you the agenda. If we could go back one slide. Uh, you can see that we're going to give you a sample of what our wonderful students submitted. We have a student speaker each grade from third through 12th, which are the 10 grades we opened the competition to. We've broken them into segments, starting with the lowest grade and ending with a recently graduated senior. At the same time, we'll announce the student submission with the most votes, the fan favorite. And between each section, you see we have a guest speaker. So let me start with a little story about why we're here. Uh, I think the parents will pick this up more than the uh, kids, but uh, uh, I hope to reach you here. As you heard, the Lieutenant Governor uh, created the COVID challenge to interest students, especially girls, in learning more about computing technologies. There are many good reasons for that. As our Educational Commissioner, Miguel Cardona, stresses, we want to offer our students unique, engaging, relevant learning opportunities that can compete for the high-tech, high-skill, high-wage careers of our 21st century economy. Economics aside, we want to give the students a chance to make a difference in their communities. Educationally, computing is a great way to master clear thinking and problem solving. And finally, suggesting computing applications to meet our challenges help the students understand that they, you, have the power to shape your increasingly digital world. As you heard, girls don't pursue computing at the rate that boys do. But we figured that girls do respond better to looking at societal needs. So the Lieutenant Governor and our committee thought a great way to launch the computing challenge was to get our students' best idea on how to use computing to address the issues that they, their families in the state face with the COVID-19 epidemic. Not only did we want to defeat the spread of the disease, but we wanted to aid communities deal with the effects of mitigation. And you'll see the scope of the ideas in our sample. So that brings me to how we did. Well, we started with the idea for the challenge in late March and the Lieutenant Governor was able to launch it on Friday, May 8th, on Governor Lamont's daily televised COVID-19 briefing. Now, because the end of the school year was coming, we could only allow you three weeks to get your ideas in. And to our delight, over that weekend, by the next Monday, we had eight entries. And at the end of the first week, we had 50. And that more than doubled in the second week. And that more than doubled again in the third and the final week. And I don't know if that person's on the call here, but one of you submitted an entry five minutes to midnight. So we ended up with 372 entries from nearly 500 students. 116 schools represented over 30% of our public school districts. And we had some private and charter schools represented as well. And in some cases, as you'll hear, teachers were able to integrate the challenge into their courses. All grades, third through 12th, were well represented. And the girls did, in fact, outnumber the boys in submitting ideas. Let's go, girl. The ideas were phenomenal. Just to give four samples, which we won't have time for today. And I apologize to everybody we didn't have time to focus on. You guys are great. You may have seen the Hartford Current article on the Ridgefield High students who recruited other students from around the country to create a single website to locate COVID-19 testing sites. We had two third graders 
who thought through unmanned temperature checking that could be located at school entrances to make it easy, to make it safer to go back to school. We had a sixth grader present a sophisticated design for a privacy sensitive contact tracer. He already has a business selling apps in both the Apple and the Google store. And I'm sure he's not the only entrepreneur among our student population. And believe me, we need more of them. We had a surprising number of apps, games, and websites developed in just three weeks. One team collected tools and created a mobile application directed toward helping teenagers deal with stress and uncertainty. They were hands down the fan favorite for 12th grade. Well, we didn't pick winners. Every student received a certificate from the Lieutenant Governor. Students voted for their favorites and they're gonna be listed today. And we did pick for today, and this we had to do earlier than the voting close, uh, a sample of ideas so that we could get you one idea from each grade. So enough from the organizers, let's go to the stars of the show, our great students. Let me introduce Patrice Gantz. Oh yes, I, I, I failed to uh, flash back one more chart, please. That's the uh, page that many of you are familiar with, the top of the homepage where you submitted your entry. Thank you so much for that. Next time, uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, Patrice Gans, the founder and executive director of Random Hacks of Kindness Junior, Inc., who will introduce elementary school submission highlights and presenters. Patrice? Thank you, Norm. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to have the honor of introducing three individuals who will share with you their amazing ideas. Early exposure to computer science during students' elementary school years is critical, as it helps to drive their interest in pursuing future studies in the field. This is especially important for girls. Exposure can take the form of a standalone class or can be embedded in the curriculum. While in-school opportunities are extremely important to ensure that all students have this opportunity and thus promote equity, outside of school computing activities are also another way for elementary students to be exposed to their power, excuse me, exposed to the power of computing. We received 142 submissions for grades three through five. Of these submissions, the community selected the following presenters as representative of the wide range of ideas collected during the challenge. Our highlights from this level will be explained by the students themselves. After each submission is presented, we will pause and take time for one or two questions. I am so excited to introduce third grader Anwisha Das. Welcome, Anwisha. Can you please tell us the name of your app, what it does, and what inspired you? Well, the name of my app is Smart Reminder. And what inspired me is I want to go back to school again, but at the same time, I want to be safe. And remember, every kid can remember the safety, safety rules again and again, all the time. Okay. So what's uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah. So also, smart reminder will will be on smart watch, so it's easy for the students to carry throughout the school day. And there's and there's pretty much three options on smart reminder. Smart reminder. The first option would be the six feet monitor. Mont it can det detect a person that's closer than six. Six feet to you. If it detects a person close Sorry, to you, sorry. we'll give a beat. Don't let me Then, please keep distance. Please keep distance. And it will only go off once you back away far enough. The next option is a twenty second second timer. When you press this button, it will give you twenty seconds to wash your hands with germs, so that all the germs get out. Then, then after the twenty seconds is done, it will give a beeping noise saying 20 seconds is done, 20 seconds is done, and then automatically go off so you don't need to touch your smartwatch again. But the, the, the third option will be will be a button that says reminder. Every one hour will pop up giving reminders of what you should do for safety rules. Like, are you wearing a mask if needed? Are you washing your hands for 20 seconds? Are you staying six feet away from a person? Um, are you washing or sanitizing your hands before you eat? And 
don't touch your face. That's and other and so on. So that's just a small reminder. Thank you. Great job. And so. Alicia, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure that adults could use your app too. Yeah, yeah, adults can use it too. Excellent, because you know the the things that you mentioned, washing your hands, staying six feet away from people, um, those are those are so critical uh, for all of us. Um, so I really appreciate you um, making sure that that kids and adults um, stay safe doing some of those important social distancing and uh, hygiene practices that that keep Connecticut safe. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, can you tell us what kinds of activities, I know you, you mentioned that you missed being back at school, what kind of activities do you miss most? Well, I miss hanging out with my friends and I miss doing all the studies, even though they're not my favorite things to do. Oh, do. my goodness. Okay. And the teacher. <laughs> Great. Uh, and Alicia, thank you so much. <laughs> Great job. Need to get morning fried rice puffs, puri bhaji. What happened? Um, okay, so do we have any other questions? All right, we're going to move on to our next presenter. As you can see on the slide, there's a list of fan favorites that have been selected by the community and their peers as the favorite app in their grade band. Our next presenter. Kashis Cole will be representing not only the fourth grade, but she's also was selected as one of the fan favorites. Welcome, Kashish. Can you tell us the name of your app and any other information that you would like to share? My idea is titled Just to Tap Away, and it is about an app which elderly individuals in our community can use to seek help from volunteers who live close by and can bring them groceries, medical supplies, and other day-to-day -day items of need. I was inspired by the distance learning program that schools use to bring classrooms to students in an online format since students couldn't go to the school. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kashish. Um, I was curious as to what, you know, what inspired you to come up with this idea. I was wondering if you know any seniors in your community who would want to use this kind of program. So uh, my grandparents are one of the people that I know in my community that would like to use one this that's that's really great um i'm sure that a lot of seniors would love to have the ability to pay using their phone as opposed to touching cash or um you know using using a card um how would you how would you propose to teach seniors how to use this because I know I learn all of my technology skills from my children. So I was curious how you were gonna show people how to do this. So there would be a place in the app where the senior could just type in, I suppose they needed some groceries. They could just type in, I need say a watermelon and uh, seven oranges and a volunteer would whoever is living closer to the uh, to the elderly individual would say I'm and if they're and if they're able to get that stuff they would say um, okay and then the elderly individual and the volunteer would discuss a time where the volunteer would bring the stuff to the elderly individual and that's great so basically you have a volunteer instacart app because instead of paying someone um to 
uh, go get your groceries for you, this a volunteer would go buy the groceries. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Kashish. It sounds fantastic. Finally, we have a team of grade five students from South Windsor who represent three different elementary schools. These students completed the challenge as part of South Windsor Public Schools Gifted and Talented Program, known as the Excel Program. The team includes Cecilia Drescher, Adeline Creole, Aaron Mitchelson, Michelson, and Eric Edstrom. Cecilia, who was joined by her brother Lyle, will present the overview for the, present the overview over there. At. Welcome, Cecilia. Our entire team is presenting. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Go for it. Should we all unmute? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh. Here. Here. Um, hi, I'm going to be doing the first part. I'm Eric. Um, we decided to make it a website because we figured that more kids can access it because not everybody has access to a phone or a device that and also they there are some things that it's like you need parent permission to download it and well that's not like a bad thing but like i don't know wait oh yeah well this you can access easier and just have to type in a link or even if you bookmark it you can just press a button and you're already there rather than having to open a whole app or maybe even ask your parents to use their phone so we decided we like more elementary level students can use it we chose the name um i'm aaron we chose the name ccgm because one it's catchy and it also gives you a general idea of what you'll find on our website because you'll find crafts games and well more um i'm adeline and the reason like we put the more at the end instead of instead of having ccgm covid crafts games and jokes and riddles and how to videos we you can just have the and more and it's like catchy so it's not just a list on and on and on and on and on about certain things and one of the main ideas for this site was that it was interactive. The people who visited, they can submit their own ideas to the site to make it to make it more theirs. It gives you an incentive to go back because there's always going to be new content because people are always going to be looking at it and adding what they think people would want to do. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing your app. It's very amazing. So does, Ed, sorry. Uh, so Lieutenant Governor, do you have some questions for the team? I, I do. So can one of you give me some examples of crafts that, that uh, young people could do that are part of your website? Well, so we have like, um, we have certain pages for it so like crafts and games and then we found um certain like how-to videos and we put them on there so they're just easy crafts that people can do with a level of um hardness like easy medium hard and then people can submit more so then um there can be more eventually hopefully yeah. Excellent. And so the craft ideas, I know with COVID, people haven't been doing a lot of shopping. Are they ideas that um, you could execute with stuff that's just hanging around your home already? Yes. Yeah. Like we have a few origami how-tos where all you need is a piece of paper and 
and yourself so that we most of the videos we found were pretty much a one material um easy to find material because I think that's great because I'm, I'm I always remember you know as a parent when my three kids wanted to do a craft it usually involved me having to go out and get all kinds of material so I think that parents um, appreciate that um, what you've come up the ideas that you've come up with can mainly be done by with what you already have uh, on hand that is so cool thank you for that Okay, well, thanks again for the great team from South Windsor. Uh, I realized I may have left off one of the students, uh, Ellie Terry. So thank you as well for your uh, submission. Um, at this time, I would like to hand the figurative mic over to Commissioner Miguel Cardona, the Commissioner of the Department of Education. Under his leadership, the Connecticut State Computer Science Plan was adopted by the State Board of Education. Welcome, Commissioner Cardona. Thank you. So happy to be here uh, and to see these wonderful students and their awesome uh, ideas. Uh, thank you for the work that you put into this and for really giving us something to think about with your creativity. Uh, as mentioned, the State Department of Education uh, fully supports computer science. In 2016, uh, they adopted a, uh, the State Board of Education adopted a computer science position statement. And just four years later, we have standards teacher certification and requirements that can be offered as part of every school program. I want to thank uh, Jen McDelec, I see her uh, here also, and others from the State uh, Department of Education that are on this call. Thank you for your work, not only on this call, but every day and what you do. Um, we know that computer science is getting more and more popular, and it's not just about technology, really. It's critical thinking skills, problem solving, communication, and we're seeing that today. We're seeing examples of that today. I'm so impressed at how you are able to do this virtually. I think that's amazing. That says, that speaks to the resilience of the students in Connecticut and uh, you're great examples of that. Not only with computer science, but just in general. So congratulations on that. We're so excited at the agency to be a part of this challenge, uh, this computing challenge. I also wanna take a moment to thank um, some of the folks on the uh, Governor's Council uh, for women, uh, Director Tim Larson, who you'll hear from in a little bit, and Commissioner Magavani also for their leadership in, in promoting uh, this important work. Uh, but most importantly, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for keeping this moving and not letting a uh, once in a lifetime pandemic slow you down. Uh, I'm, I'm inspired by your energy and your passion for continuing to promote not only computer science and STEM, but also uh, making sure that uh, young women have the same opportunity to show their talents and their skills and their creativity. Um, we, we support that and uh, I appreciate your leadership on that. Students, I love seeing your, your smiling faces, um, your great work, your preparation, your communication has been awesome. I'm very impressed. Even your backdrop, Eric, I love your backdrop there. It's really nice. You got the window in the back, uh, just fantastic. You're doing an awesome job. I look forward to continuing to hear uh, the presentations and thank you for participating in it and for just brightening up uh, Connecticut with your awesome ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cardona. That was really inspiring. And actually, you introduced the next speaker. Um, uh, if I could introduce, uh, um, let me just ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Oh, good, good. Uh, uh, I can I introduce a, the speaker, a person I cannot say enough about. It has been such a pleasure over the last few years working with her on, on the advisory computing and computer science. Let me introduce Commissioner Cardona's leader for computer science in the Department of Education, Jennifer Michalak. Uh, she's going to introduce the middle school submission highlighter, highlights and presenters. Jennifer. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Norm, for those kind words. Um, middle school is where I spent the majority of my time teaching, so I'm excited and honored to be able to introduce our middle school highlights. As was mentioned at the beginning of today's showcase by the Lieutenant Governor, one important goal is to ensure representation from girls. We know nationally 
that the lack of interest occurs as early as grade four for our female students. Although more than half of our teams that submitted were led by girls, we did notice in our challenge that this declined in terms of the number of female participants beginning in grade six. So as a committee, we know that this is something we will still need to strive to improve upon. At the middle school level, we had over 100 submissions, although today we will only be highlighting three. As you heard from our elementary students, the students have a way of explaining themselves better than any of us adults could possibly imagine. So at this time, I would like to have the students explain their apps, and we'll go one at a time and use the similar format with questions following. So first, I would like to introduce you Corey, Jun Corey Jones Jr., who represents Crane 6. Corey? Hello. Can you tell us a little bit about your app, Corey, its name, and what you plan on it to do? So the app I'm thinking of is an app that reminds you to wash your hands. The name of it is Sanitizing Reminder. I'm trying to help decrease the transmission of the virus. Hand hygiene is the most effective action to stop transmission. The idea is the yeah, the idea and functionality of my computing submission is an app, of course. You activate the app on the device on your choice, and it will alert you to wash your hands every 20 to 30 minutes. My app will give you notification choices like pop-up pictures, music, or a voice that, are, that reminds you to wash your hands. On computers, you would receive a simple notification on the bottom right of your screen. Excellent, Corey. Um, that certainly sounds like an important app. Is there anyone who has a question for Corey in terms of what his app is capable of or what he sees it doing? So, Corey, could you just tell us a little bit about um, how you communicated this to other people and how you got ideas from others to develop your app? Well, to be honest, I didn't that much. It was kind of just an idea I had in the back of my head. <laughs> Usually the best ideas are the ones when you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a great idea. Who did you share it with first and what, what were their thoughts on it? Um, I shared it with my immediate family. I, I always think the simplest ideas are the most, they're always the most powerful. And so um, I think in addition to mask wearing, um, washing your hands, as you pointed out, is just, uh, those are two of the best ways uh, to prevent the spread of, of COVID. So thank you so much, Corey. Corey, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what do you want to take another computer course computer science course uh i don't know if you did which one would be offered in your school next do you know i'm not sure to be honest well i think that's something we teachers need to figure out i'm betsy dillard i'm president of the computer science teachers association so i'll be asking your teachers i'll see you later corey thank you Great. Thank you, Corey, for being willing to field those questions um, and for presenting your app. Next, we'd like to hear from our grade seven representative, Lila Dow. Hello. Uh, so my um, website idea was Lockdown Escape. I was inspired by this because I, before quarantine, was a very busy person. My week, my weeks were full of stuff to do, like extracurricular activities, and when quarantine came around, I got very bored very fast. Um, I started looking up stuff to do on websites and I only found things meant for like six-year-olds and then 18-year-olds and up. And 
I didn't want to, I didn't find any interest in the things they had. So my website is a website that is specifically to cure boredom um, of all ages. It will have suggestions for a ages like um, movie recommendations, TV shows, crafts, arts, um, recipes for cooking and baking and other stuff. Um, outdoor activities, indoor activities, and things just to cure boredom all around. Excellent, Lila. I think that's such a great thing. Middle school is a tough age, and I think you're right that there's often times a lot of focus on our youngest learners and our adults, and sometimes we forget about those um, tweens and teens. Does anybody have any questions for Lila? I have a question for Lila. Lila, this is Dr. Cardona, the Commissioner of Education. I love that idea. And I think one thing I've heard, not only from my children, but from many others, is that they're bored. Yeah. So, it you know, it's been many years since I've been in seventh grade, but I wonder what are the top two or three activities that you think students your age would click on? Um. Well, I think one of the biggest things is watching Netflix. Definitely, I find a particular interest in that too. Um. Also, maybe outdoor sports. Uh, I play lacrosse and. My season was canceled, so I didn't have much to do. And maybe another thing or something specifically I like to do is I like to bake a lot. Mm. Oh, that's great. Those are three three good ones. So uh, Netflix, what are we watching on Netflix? What are you recommending? Uh, well, I finished watching Avatar. Um, okay. and I am also was watching Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Those are some great ideas. I think the baking one is one that we're seeing more and more students doing things like that. And that's a great thing to see. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. And Commissioner, I'd also like to share that, you know, baking is all about chemistry. So I think boys and girls should be thinking about that. A lot of measuring, a lot of fractions, a lot of mixing, and a lot of eating, which is good too. Thank you, Lila, um, for sharing your app. To round out our middle school submissions, we have Devin Hazelton, who is an eighth grader from Timothy Edwards Middle School in South Windsor. Devin, would you please present your app? Perhaps Devin was unable to join us today or have, is having some technical difficulties. Um, I always find it fun when we talk about computer science and have technical glitches. It shows the need that this is an ever growing field. Um, perhaps if Devin. Yeah, and I think Devin is there. He was actually talking. I think he's just on mute, um, but I did see him talking. I just couldn't hear him. Oh, perfect. Devin, are you able to unmute yourself? We would love to hear about your app. He's put in the chat that he's unmuted, so I hear so that we may be having some technical difficulty. His mic isn't working right now. What I'll ask Devin is if you can put in the chat a little bit about your app so that we can all see that and I'll be happy to share with everyone. And if your mic begins to work, we're more than happy to come back and have you speak to it. Um, but at this time, I don't want to put you on the spot anymore and make you feel uncomfortable. So I would just like to share with everyone on the call that in addition to these great um, <clears throat> apps that we just heard about from our middle school students, we did have some fan favorites. Fan favorites were determined through peer voting. And you see those top vote getters highlighted on the screen. We have also created a link that is specific towards the fan favorites. And that link will be shared at the conclusion of this presentation. 
We ask that everyone check out these wonderful ideas from all of our students. Before I move on to the next slide, I do want to check back in with our friend Devin and see if he's able to be heard. Devin? Okay, we'll move on for now and I'll check back with him um, in a minute. Devin, there's a phone number there. This is uh, Commissioner Cardona. There's a phone number in the chat. It would be awesome to hear about what you did. So if you could pick up a, a cell phone and call that number, and then we can do a mic check and we can hear about your tool project. And while Devin is trying to locate a phone and calling in, what I would like to do now is I would like to draw your attention to the fact that you may have noticed we had a submission highlighted from South Windsor at both the elementary and the middle school level, and you will also see one at the high school level. We found as a committee that South Windsor showed a continuum of computer science K-12, and we think that the best way to learn is to learn about best practices that are occurring. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Stephen Albrecht, John Smith Horn, and Stephen Mishna, who will give us a little bit of perspective on how South Windsor approaches computer science education. Gentlemen. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, Mrs. Beisowitz and Commissioner Cardona, thank you for joining us today as we celebrate the excellent ideas and hard work of Connecticut students. Uh, I'm Steve Albrecht, and I'm a curriculum specialist for South Windsor Public Schools. As Ms. Gann said, it's very important to provide exposure to computer science in the early grades. South Windsor provides a continuum of exposure starting at our elementary schools and carrying forward to our high school. All of our students in grades kindergarten through five take a STEM class that provides exposure to coding through programs such as Rosie's Runtime and Tinker. We also organize an annual Hour of Code, which is a national initiative that asks teachers to dedicate one hour of class time in December to coding activities. Our district's technology coaches recommend grade appropriate coding games and they provide classroom teachers with how-to guides and a script for introducing coding to elementary students during that hour of code. We continue promoting hour of code in the middle school grades and all sixth grade students complete a year long class called digital literacy, which focuses on using technology responsibly and productively. All eighth grade students complete a course in automation and robotics, which is taught by technical education teachers who challenge students to assemble and program small, small robots that can perform a variety of functions. Students in our gifted and talented program, several of whom are here today, often rely on technology and computer skills to compete at the state's annual Skills 21 Expo Fest, which focuses on innovation. Our high school's career and technical education department offers several classes related to computer science. And this is largely thanks to our computer science teacher, Jamie Lang. She is on leave and unable to join us today. Her background is in IT and she developed a course called Video Game Design and Computer Programming in 2013. Given the popularity of that class, we added Advanced Placement Computer Science in 2015 and in 2018, we moved advanced placement mobile computer science principles from the math department to our career and technical education department. Last year, students in Mrs. Lang's courses facilitated hour of code activities in our sixth grade digital literacy classes. Stephen Mishna, who is in the room today, taught Mrs. Lang's classes while she has been on leave. High school students say that they enroll in computer science classes because they loved their middle school robotics class. Others are inspired by their parents' work in a computer-related career, or they're following the same kind of career path that their uh, older siblings followed. Computer science exposure continues outside of the classroom in several ways. High school students may join our very successful FIRST robotics team, which has earned titles at the state, national, and world levels of competition. 
students may also join our after school computer science club. Typically, we see about 30% of students enrolled in our computer science related classes are girls. So to draw more girls to computer science, students in the senior class plan and host an annual Women in STEM Day, which aims to expand girls' interest in science, technology, engineering, and math-related fields. So if there are any questions that uh, Mr. Mishna or Mr. Smithhorn, who is our gifted and talented coordinator, can answer, um, we'd be glad to continue our conversation. I just want to say I've worked with Jamie in the past at um, in a Hartford program, and she's a phenomenal teacher. I hope she comes back soon. Steve, you shared with us uh, earlier the number of students that are in your classes. It's one of the largest in the state. Uh, uh, could you share it with the community? Yeah, uh, I, I wish I had a specific, you know, a precise number for you. I can say, you know, at the uh, you know elementary level, all of our students are going through uh, that that STEM class. It's a, a requirement that um, all students, grades five uh, K through five, will participate in, and likewise, all of our sixth graders and all of our eighth graders are going to go through first digital literacy class and then through uh, automation and robotics. When we get up to the high school. Um, uh, it, Jamie has a, a full teaching load just dedicated to uh, computer science and mobile CSP, which uh, are classes that have grown tremendously since we first began offering them. Um, you know, you know, Jamie is teaching uh, computer science, you know, all day long, and um, you know, I, I, I expect that the day will come soon where we're going to have to look to uh, uh, accommodate some increased requests for those classes. Yeah, it is uh, our theory and on the advisory committee that this is a missed opportunity for so many schools to add this into the curriculum, that there's an unmet demand that um, uh, we should be meeting for the sake of the kids and for the sake of the state. Thank you so much. If, if I could, I brought up Devin Hazeltine's uh, uh, wonderful entry and uh, I'm no substitute, but uh, his idea was a GPS-based social distancing app. He called it Bubble, and you'll get, see why, because it's not a simple six-foot distance app. Uh, it's based on GPS, as I said. Uh, the GPS will feed multiple players, uh, and uh, you can set the, the size of the bubble based on your risk factors. So that uh, if you're at higher risk, you can make the bubble larger, something that um, uh, really matters a lot. Uh, it also is tied into uh, information from the CDC and other websites, and it keeps you connected to what's best known about social distancing today. It ends with, and this is quite subtle for a eighth grader, a disclaimer that it's not a suitable replacement for any healthcare professional. And I'm sorry if his parents are lawyers, it cannot be held liable if a user of the app contracts COVID. I do, do, do apologize, but, uh, but too many lawyers in society. Perhaps that's the right. Excuse me. Okay. Thank you, Southwind. You're a wonderful example for other school districts in the state. And so let me introduce actually my partner, Kristen Violette, who uh, uh, Susan asked to meet, the Lieutenant Governor asked to meet with uh, uh, um, early on. Uh, and we uh, were the ones that uh, did the research for her on the available apps and when, when she assigned it to the uh, Council on Women and Girls. So Kristen, please, for the high school kids. Thank you very much, Norm, and good morning to everybody. Um, so far, the apps that we've seen have been so creative and quite viable solutions. Um, while she gets herself um, 
checked in on the phone so that we can hear everything that she has to say. I think we can jump right in with Isabella. If you would be willing to share your app, Isabella is our highlight from grade nine representing Ridgefield High School. Isabella? Hello, um, I'm Isabella and I've come up with a mobile app called Headcount. And Headcount would be an app that lets the customer know how many people are in a store or restaurant at a time. And my app focuses on both the, both the customer and the business. For the customer, the app will know in advance how many people are maximum in the location and the wait time. The customer will be able to be the next one in line and the app will alert the customer once they are next. The customer will know then either to say like, I'm not going or within a set time, proceed to the establishment without any waiting. The business will know its daily demand and can track inventory better than even advertise the um, uh, advertising um, during COVID, we waited a long time in lines outside to get into places like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, and restaurants, and even other stores. And it has taken up to two hours just to food shop because of the wait, and or sometimes we would even just leave, so we wouldn't get um get what we needed, and the um, business would lose their money and. This was the resulting into the customer wasting gas money, time, and not getting what they needed. So I, um, I came up with the app Headcount and hoping that it will make an impact for everyone really during this pandemic. And yeah, thank you. Excellent, Isabella. Kristen, are you on the phone now? Yeah, we're still having trouble hearing you, Kristen. There's a lot of back theme. So we'll continue moving on as Kristen tries to get her um, speaker and mic cooperating. Next up, representing grade 10 from Cheshire High School, I'm honored to introduce you, Vincent Kai. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my idea was the uh, transit capacity safety software. And the, the basic idea here is um, since public transportation is an essential service um, and it's one of the services um, that has the most ability to spread COVID-19 because people are in a enclosed bus or subway car, um, we could use computer software to improve social distancing aboard public transportation. So um, I'm sure I'm sure Transit, which is the app that uh, CT Transit uses to track um, the the real time location of buses in Connecticut, um, has this feature already. Um, but it's in its um, preliminary stages. And um, basically, what we're talking about here is a capacity tracker. So riders have um uh have more information about how crowded a bus is because um crowded buses can be very dangerous uh in the time of COVID-19. So um it basically relays data over from um trackers uh or or um or foot traffic counters at the at the um at the doors of the buses and that data is then sent to a mobile app which could potentially be an, an already established one like transit or um, a, a new government provi provided one just, just for the purpose of COVID-19. And um, this can dramatically reduce uh, the crowding aboard these vehicles because if riders are informed, they can um, perhaps use, use a, another means of transport if they know that their bus is going to be crowded. So um, yeah, I hope we can, make this a reality because a lot of people um especially those who ride transit depend on transit um really want this to uh to become a reality this is uh miguel cardona the commissioner i have a question for both vincent and isabella because it seems to me that headcount uh and um your app uh, what you're talking about, the transit capacity safety software, are both intended to try to identify 
uh, the, the number of people in a given location or on a transit uh, uh, method. And you said there's a counter. What are your thoughts, either one of you or both of you, on how that might be potentially linked to either a phone if somebody opts into it or some other method? Or do you think a counter would be the best method moving forward? Well, um, in terms of uh, public transportation, I think the latter option would be what I would go for um, because it's, it's uh, I mean, if we're talking about um, like crowdsourcing or using a mobile application to determine capacity, I think that's not as accurate um, of a measure as uh, using like a counter, like kind of like a retail store would would um, would count foot traffic um, uh, in entering their their store. Uh, a bus can do the same thing. Um, so I, I I think that's the general um, the general idea I'm going for. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Isabella, thank you. Um, I was thinking like when someone like walks into um the store or a restaurant. They would keep like a tally of how many people had walked in and walked out. I see. So it's like a live count. Gotcha. Thank you. Hi. I've been trying to get hi, uh, Commissioner Cordona. This is Bongi Makubane. Um, I have the same kind of questions because I'm very interested in this idea of knowing how many people are in a particular location. So, Vincent, you talked about um, when entering a bus with a counter. Can you hear how that works? Because I, um, I'm at the DMV and we're very interested in um, helping to maintain social distance by making sure that we don't have too many people in any of our locations. So, can you share a little bit of how that would work? Um, the, the counting software? Yeah. Or, um, so counting would actually, um, be done more with hardware. Uh, as I was saying, the, um, the, the, the foot, uh, traffic, um, as done in a, in a, uh, as done in a retail store. Um, I'm not 100% aware, um, of how the, the, um, the hardware aspect of it, um, would work. Um, but there's, uh, there's there's cities such as Seattle and New York that um have implemented this in their buses. I, I, I'm not sure um uh, actually how like the 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 mechanism works. But okay. um if we if we look at um say other cities, uh, I think we can get a good idea of of um of of uh, of an example of how this counting software can can work. This is really tremendous because these um, applications, both of them, have real world opportunity to apply to keep our um, community safe. So thank you so much for this. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you to both commissioners um, for jumping in and asking the questions that I think are really important as we see the evolution of these apps as we move from elementary up to the high school um, and the complexity that we're seeing um, is wonderful. Before we hear from our final high school um, I'm he hearing that Devin may have been able to join us by phone. Devin, are you there? Apparently not, we'll keep trying. Um, to round out our high school entries, um, let us hear now from Erin Muchek, who is representing grade 11 from South Windsor High School. Erin? Hi, thank you. Um, so my submission is called Town Council. And the issue that I focused on is figuring out how to continue local government while COVID-19 prevents people from gathering in person for referendums, town forums, stuff like that. So my design is an app called Town Council that allows residents of a town to participate in informal votes on decisions that would affect public spaces. So the goal is to give our leaders a secure way to collect public opinion on renovating a school or cleaning up parks while still allowing ill or older residents to participate safely at home. Um, so the app, in order to make sure that everyone who votes is a resident in that town, would have a database of ID numbers and a different code would be sent out in the mail to every registered voter in the town. And once it's activated, it can no longer be used. 
So the app basically focuses on secure opinion polls, but the goal is just to start developing secure ways to keep the political process alive um, and equally accessible to everyone, no matter the circumstances. I hope our legislature is paying attention because they haven't quite figured this out yet um, as to how to have committee hearings. And if yours is successful at the local level, I think there's so many towns and cities, uh, Aaron, that would use this for Board of Ed, Board of Finance, Town Council, um, even like Park and Rec Commission meetings. I think it's, yeah. it's brilliant and I can't wait for our legislators to learn about it. Are there any questions for Aaron? I have a question. Uh, this is Commissioner Cardona. Aaron, what a great idea. Are you familiar with Kahoot? Have you used Kahoot? Yes. So I wonder if this would be an entry point for many other people who are not familiar with Kahoot to think about it from a municipal perspective versus from a school perspective. And it could almost be pre-populated with questions that might be asked in municipalities that lend themselves, almost like a menu of options. I love this idea. Um, uh, do you plan on, do you plan on sharing this with a local official or do you have a, a strategy or have you considered, or would you consider a strategy on sharing this with uh, maybe a, a municipal leader that might be receptive to it to see if it could be beta tested somewhere? I'm sure Mr. Albrecht would uh, be happy to help too. Mr. Albrecht, I just want to thank you also for everything that you're doing and the tremendous work that's happening in the district. But would you consider taking this to the next level and pitching it a little bit? I would definitely be receptive to that idea. The goal is definitely just to help local communities and whoever could best use that technology. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I'd like to thank our highlight, uh, the high school highlighted submissions. One of the things that I've always enjoyed about being an educator is as young adults and children, they think outside the box and they aren't thinking about the constraints and why we can't do something, they try to make it happen, which I think we have absolutely seen in these submissions today. As mentioned before, there were additional submissions that were fan favorites for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We really encourage everyone to check out these wonderful ideas, and particularly those on the call who find something worthwhile for their own needs as Commissioner Cardona just said, feel free to reach out to these fine young people and see if they can help you with their needs. I believe that Kristen has been able to join us again. Kristen, if you're on, was there a few things you would like to say before you introduce our next speaker? Um, yes, um, just doing a quick check. Okay, so well, one thing about computer science, not only is it about critical thinking and problem solving, but also about resiliency, right? And so um, experiencing a little bit of that today here with some uh, technical issues. But I do just want to personally thank all of the students that have shown some great creative and viable solutions, you know, and just to kind of um, as a high school teacher, you know, when we're thinking about coding and computer science at the high school level, I think our focus is a little bit more pointed in terms of best preparing students for college as well as for careers. You know, as we know, many of today's jobs didn't even exist 20 years ago, and most of tomorrow's jobs are yet to even be known. But what we do know is that computer science will play a critical role um, in the creation and the implementation of these future careers. So that's why I'm uh, I personally feel that computer science education should be mandatory at the high school level, like science and math. But it's also why I'm super excited that these um, coding challenges open to high school students and that we had, uh, I believe, 127 entries from high school students. So it was great to see um, the lieutenant governor provide our Connecticut students with the opportunity to think critically and collaborate in some cases and solve a real world problem, which is honestly the best way we're going to prepare them for you know, post high school experiences, whichever path they may um, take. 
So I just want to thank everybody. Um, and also, I'm not sure if Jennifer did this or not, but definitely want to uh, draw your attention um, to the fan favorites. You know, as you know, they have been uh, crowdsourced and been uh, earned the award of fan favorites. So the details on their apps can be found on the website. Um, and so as you see their names in the schools listed on the slide. So um, without uh, delaying this any further, you know, I would like to introduce our next speaker. We have with us today, Commissioner Magubani. She's the commissioner of the Department of Motor Vehicles, as well as the co-chair of the Education and STEAM subcommittee of the Governor's Counselor for Women and Girls. So um, Commissioner, welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Before I say any further remarks, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank the Lieutenant Governor for setting a bold vision for Connecticut to address the underrepresentation of women in, in STEM fields. As you can see by today's uh, uh, submissions, she actually met that goal. So really what the students um, did today is make a huge step forward in helping achieve our goal. The Education and STEAM Committee is so proud of what the students have done today. As you stated, um, Kristen, the solutions that the students presented provide real world applications in terms of supporting some of the challenges that we, we face. As you said, I'm the commissioner of the DMV and many of the solutions that I was reading have real applications for some of the challenges that we are facing today. And I'm really excited in thinking about how do we pilot, as uh, Commissioner Cardona said, some of these uh, solutions that the students have presented. And I'm going to follow up to see exactly what we can really do in seeing how these work for us, because the students have done a tremendous opportunity. I wanna take this opportunity to recognize my co-chair, uh, Director Larson, who's not here today, he was directly involved in all of the work in coordinating with the, with the teams that put this together along with the Lieutenant Governor. I also want to thank the members of the Coding Challenge team for all of the work that they did for us. This, um, all of the work that the students did really puts Connecticut, I think, in the forefront of showing, showcasing how brilliant our students are. And I am so, so proud to have been part of this program. And uh, I really look forward to seeing where we go from here. So the experience I think gives students a real leg up in getting real world experience in, in the world that's driven by technology. Again, I wanna thank the educators for all of the time that you spent preparing our students. It really shows the work that you've done. Again, thank you. And um, on behalf of the coding uh, subcommittee, as well as on behalf of the women and girls, we are so proud and we thank everyone for all of their efforts in the work that they've done. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. That was really wonderful. And, and uh, uh, you're absolutely right. These students are just phenomenal. And, and you can see uh, the growth uh as they go through the years that uh, they get more and more sophisticated more and more deeper understanding and more and more capable of really affecting the state almost directly uh just to point out uh facebook microsoft were founded by college freshmen so um, uh, this is something that's a field that uh, gives returns to people uh, uh, early on with brilliant ideas. So if I could, uh, we'll move on then. Uh, I'm uh, here to point out that uh, we didn't include a 12th grader in the uh, last set. Uh, we think of the 12th grade as the capstone of public education, uh, one that shows what you can achieve through 12 years of public school. So if you ask one 12th grader, to reflect on her experience in overcoming the seeming barriers uh, to uh, computing. There's a chart uh, if, that you could flip to, please. There she is. That's Melissa Wu. Uh, she's a recent graduate of Greenwich High School. Uh, I should point out that she graduated as Go Valedictorian. Uh, 
Uh, she's co-president of the uh, Girls Who Code Club. She's also uh, a CEO and founder of her own uh, not-for-profit to spread STEM to underprivileged areas. And she's been involved in uh, uh, a couple of really award-winning app developments. So what we thought we'd do is ask her to explain how she got interested in computing and how she either ignored or overcame the barriers to getting uh, girls involved in studying computer science. Uh, Michelle? Melissa? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, and Michelle's your sister, right? Yes. Good. Uh, who also, by the way, graduated as valedictorian of Greenwich High School and, uh, and also studied computer science. So please, Melissa. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Wu. I'm so honored to be speaking today, and I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about my experience in computer science and particularly my experiences as a girl in computer science. So I've always been interested in the STEM field, which when I was younger took the form of various science projects in elementary school, like how I could blow the biggest bubbles or clean pennies with vinegar. And my interest in computer science was really piqued by a middle school workshop with Scratch, which is a block coding software that was created by MIT. And I made a few interactive stories, created a game or two, and really got excited by how much freedom I had to create whatever I could come up with. But in high school, I wasn't really sure how to continue my interest in computer science. The field as a whole really just seemed so difficult to enter, and I didn't really know where to start. My high school had a programming club, which was mainly made up of senior boys and all of whom already knew how to code really, really well. So that year I joined the newly founded Girls Who Code Club at my high school and found an incredible community of fellow girls who were also really interested in learning more about computer science. And we entered a computing challenge that was really similar to this one. It was called the Verizon App Challenge. And we faced the task of brainstorming a mobile app that we believed would help solve a real world community problem. As a group of high school girls in the midst of the Me Too movement, my friends and I decided to create an app called Under My Wing. And it's a sexual assault protection app with features like self-defense training, fake phone calls, and emergency contact and police hotlines. And along the way, we faced a ton of difficulties, whether that was bugs in our code or being challenged on why a few high school girls should try and create their own app. But persevering was so worth it because it allowed us to discover the wonder of computing and recognize the importance of using computer science to address real world issues, just like we've seen in this computing challenge today. And opening the door to app development was really pivotal for me, and I found other ways to apply computer science to causes that I was passionate about. For my science research project, I also created a melanoma diagnosis app, which is based on the premise that even though melanoma is relatively treatable if detected early, it still accounts for thousands of deaths every year. And my app not only increases the accessibility of diagnostic processes, it also increases accuracy by relying on a data-driven approach for melanoma diagnosis. Just like under my wing, pretty much no step of this process was easy, to say the least, but somehow I made it through with a ton of hard work, seeking help from and looking up to incredible mentors and believing that I was capable of achieving in the computer science field, not despite of, but because of the fact that I'm a girl. I have been so impressed by all of the incredible computing challenge ideas here today, and I'm confident that many of you have either been able to or will discover the power of propelling products of the imagination into reality. And this type of hands-on experience in solving real-world problems with technology is really just so invaluable. So the message that I really want to share with everyone, but especially all of the girls watching this today, always keep trying and challenging the stereotypes that you might face in computer science because it is so incredibly worth it. 
If you're looking for ways to get started, I really recommend exploring Scratch or Hour of Code, which we heard a little bit about earlier. And there's tons of opportunities to create fun projects or games. Or if you're looking for a way to get started in developing your phone app from this challenge, MIT App Inventor is another block coding software that makes it really easy to create a smartphone app. I'm a strong believer that everyone should have the opportunity to get involved in computer science, especially girls. And of course, I would be remiss to not also mention the need to close other disparities in computer science education, particularly those due to differences in socioeconomic status. There are many communities that have little or no access to STEM education, despite the fact that STEM will most definitely be a pivotal field in the future. And to address this issue, I founded a nonprofit called STEM for All after taking an entrepreneurship course and working with Girls with Impact, which is a nonprofit dedicated to providing teen girls with the skills necessary to launch their own community venture projects. And my nonprofit aims to expand access to STEM education by holding local coding classes and using that revenue to fund STEM-focused extracurricular programs and provide necessary resources in less privileged areas. It's my hope that STEM education will be available for all children, for both boys and girls, and in both wealthier and less privileged communities, allowing them to apply computing to societal issues, pursue their passions, and explore the depth of opportunities provided by computer science. Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor and all of the other people out there who are dedicated to ensuring that this can become a reality sooner rather than later. Thanks. Melissa, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience. And I wanted to um, just say a few things uh, about you that you didn't say about yourself. Um, we, we wanted you to talk about your personal experience and, um, let me just say how proud we are, uh, that you are the co-valedictorian of Greenwich High School and, um, a part of the girls, um, who code club that created the Under My Wing app, um, to respond to issues of, uh, sexual assault. Um, the, you should know that the Girls Who Code Club entered um, that app into this Verizon app contest and their idea, sorry, I have to brag on our Connecticut's finest here, their idea won best in state, best in region, and best in nation. So um, we are uh, very, very proud of you. Um, the team won $10,000 to develop their app and $10,000 for the school, as well as um, help from an expert at the MIT App Innovator, uh, which is an app creation program uh, at MIT. Um, and, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. I think that was just transient noise there. So now what I wanted to do is ask Melissa uh, a few questions about um, the things that she's worked on. But before we go any further, Melissa, there was one thing that I know a lot of people are wondering about, where are you going to college in the fall? Uh, next year, I'm going to Princeton University. Excellent. Well, they're, they are lucky to have you, and we want you to come back to Connecticut after you've gone to Princeton. Uh, Thank because you. we want to make use of your brain power in our state. So, um, what um, I wanted to, um, to learn um, what it was like competing in the Verizon coding challenge because. Um, you won at the state, region, and national level. D 
did you and your teammates think that was going to happen? And what were you, tell us about the whole process of going through all of that, because that's just amazing. Yeah, it was absolutely such an incredible experience. I mean, we had no idea that our app idea was going to go that far in the beginning. It was one of the first main projects of the uh, Girls Who Code Club, and it really all started with us just sitting in a classroom brainstorming, looking around at what issues that we thought we would really be able to address with technology. And when we first submitted the idea, we had all of these different features that we were creating a storyboard for because we were just so excited by all of the possibilities. And at each stage of the competition, as we kept getting recognition and getting more opportunities to turn our explained app concept into an actual product, it was really just such an incredible experience, such a learning process and really an ability to grow not only as a coder, but also as a thinker and learning perseverance and creativity and also how to keep going when really very little is working out in the moment. Uh, I think we all we all could uh, benefit uh, from from that. Could you also tell us what gave you the inspiration for coming up with the melanoma diagnosis app because that's very intriguing that's that's a medical app so tell us tell us about that so that was my project for uh science research so greenwich high school has a really really great independent science research program where if you're in the class you're kind of given um opportunity to pursue a project that you're interested in with the support of uh, Mr. Bramante who is a teacher at the high school and a really incredible mentor. So I was interested in melanoma diagnosis because my friend's father was um, struggling with the disease and one of the greatest issues that he faced throughout his uh, throughout his sickness was that he really just wasn't diagnosed early enough. And when I looked into the current melanoma diagnosis practices, I was really surprised to discover that it's mainly qualitative, which means that it's just based primarily on a visual examination, like the dermatologist just looks at your skin. So I really wanted to find a way to introduce data into that to try and increase the accuracy. And this was after I had already worked on Under My Wing. So I was really excited about all the potential in app development, not only with how available and accessible smartphones are, but also how much computing power they have. So that's where that idea came about. And then I spent, um, spent the year working on that app, developing it, testing it, creating all of the models. Thank you. And so um, you mentioned um, your nonprofit, and I'll tell you that one of the things that the governor and I are very concerned about, and this concern was only um, more focused and highlighted during COVID-19, that um, there are there's an issue of equity and access with respect to internet, with respect to uh, computing. And we found that some students in, particularly in urban areas, didn't have internet access at their home or didn't have computers. And, and when you're trying to do distance learning, this is a little difficult if you don't have access to those basic necessities. So can you tell us a little more about the nonprofit that you have, please? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're working on scaling up right now. We're mainly based in the uh, Greenwich Stamford area. So the way that it works is high school volunteers go to either local elementary schools, uh, local libraries, boys and girls club, and we teach local coding programs where we're working with the kids to 
teach them foundational coding concepts or working on creating games in Scratch. And we use uh, the funds from teaching all of these classes to help partner with organizations that are dedicated to expanding STEM access, rather that's by uh, making sure that kids in urban areas have access to necessary resources like internet or laptop, or whether that's helping fund extracurricular programs, because in many areas, it's not just about like having internet, you know, you also have to have the resources to be able to have an after school club or have teachers work with kids to provide all of these extracurricular opportunities. So we've been, uh, we've had several successful programs where we're able to not only increase computer science education in our own communities, but also work on a greater level to try and expand that access and share those opportunities. Great, thank you. And um, can you tell us, are you working on any apps at the moment, and we want to know the name of your company so that we all can invest in it. Um, well, I am still working a little bit on Under My Wing and the Melanoma Diagnosis app, just kind of continuing and also um, working on developing some ideas, but nothing, uh, nothing yet in terms of company. We didn't, we didn't want you to give away any proprietary secrets, but we're looking forward to hearing more. And my final question for you is, what advice would you give to young girls and young women about why they should be involved in STEM fields? Well, I would say, and this is kind of a personal reflection on what really drew me most into the STEM field, but here you have the opportunity to look at the world around you, decide what you want to change about it, and leverage these incredible opportunities and use all of the potential that you see in either computers or engineering or math, all of these different fields that really can impact the world around you. And you can, once you learn how to, whether it's creating an app or a website or anything else that you want to do, there's just so much potential and so many opportunities within the STEM field to change what you can imagine and see all of that change happen in the real world. So, if you're interested in STEM, and hopefully you are because you're on this webinar right now, really just keep pursuing those opportunities and never give up. Just keep trying because even when it's not working out, you're still learning something and it is really just so incredibly worth it when you get to the end of the road and you kind of look back at what you've been able to learn and what you've been able to explore within the STEM field. Great, thank you so much, um, Melissa. And the only thing that I would add to uh, what you so eloquently said is um, how uh, we need to encourage more young girls and young women to consider um, working in STEM fields. And that means that they need to be studying um, education in STEAM. Uh, and the importance of that is this, that one of the reasons that women still make um, much less dollar for dollar than men make is because men dominate the STEAM fields and we need more women to be involved with those so that they will have the higher paying jobs that exists now and that will continue to exist in greater numbers in the future. So Melissa, thank you so much uh, for your inspiration. I want to thank our commissioners, uh, Magubane and Cardona um, and, and Larson for all of their 
hard work. And it's just been an incredible pleasure to hear from each of our smart, competent students who have um, such amazing uh, ideas. And we can't wait to see what you're going to be doing uh, in the future. And so now I'd like to turn it back to Norm, who is going to give us closing remarks. Thank you so much, Norm. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, uh, we really look forward to working with you to further inspire students. By the way, I forgot to mention Dato, uh, founded here in Norwalk by uh, Austin McCord in his father's basement when he was back from his uh, undergraduate studies, um, our uh, largest unicorn is billion dollar company. So uh, uh, before we leave, uh, there's just a large number of people we have to thank. The two leaders of the Council on Women and Girls, or Girls deserve special thanks, Noelle Kidney and Cherie Phoenix Sharp. They have been just phenomenal. Lots of weekend and evening work. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm a member of a great team. We're calling ourselves the Tech Champions team. I won't uh, thank everyone individually, but they really deserve it. Uh, I should point out, I have to point out, that none of this would be possible without the computer support of the team from the rest at Advance. Uh, Matt Mervis, Cameron Audia have been tremendous. Cameron was just spectacular with meeting tight schedule. There are far too many other people to thank, but I do want to give a shout out to the Lieutenant Governor's intern. Coral Ortiz and James Carosino. Thank you so much for coming and spending the summer helping us out. Norm, can I just, I'm gonna just interject one thing for all of our young people is we have amazing college interns. So if uh, you would like to apply to the Lieutenant Governor's internship program, uh, just go to our website and I hope um, some of these young, smart young people. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Hey, and thank you all for participating. Bevan, my heart goes out to you for not being able to get that speaker to work, but uh, we really appreciated your, your idea. Uh, we all can't help feel optimistic about the future of the state with such great students. So, have a great summer and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.